Good evening. A warm welcome to you all. I am Shaneen Akhtar from the Islamic Center of Boston in Wayland. And first I want to thank all the trustees uh, of this uh, Southborough Library for uh, their commitment to uh, educating communities and providing us this wonderful opportunity to come together. I, I have been involved with interfaith work for almost 20 years, and I'm an interfaith liaison for Muslim community. It's, it's my passion, and I'm committed to nurturing pluralistic values embedded in Islam. I started an interfaith book club at the Wayland Mosque after 9-11. We also meet at the Temple Shatikva in Wayland. I have another book group in Framingham, which meets at the Open Spirit Center. I'm also a member of Framingham and uh, Wayland Clergy Association. In addition, through my uh, interfaith work, I have developed wonderful relationships with clergy leaders of several towns. So for uh, my presentation, I would begin with what is Islam and Islam's connection with Judaism and Christianity? The Arabic word Islam means peace or submission. A person who believes in one God, our creator, and makes a covenant with him to live his or her life according to his teachings, the Quran, that person is called a Muslim, meaning a submitter in English. Islam's message is not new. The story of Islam begins with Adam and Eve and continues through the prophets. Since Islam is the continuation of the Abrahamic message of monotheism, we give great reverence to all the biblical prophets. There are 25 prophets mentioned in the Quran. We have Moses and Isaac, Jacob, would you like to, could you please, next slide. Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last messenger of God in the chain of all the prophets. As Muslims, we are required to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, as one of the greatest messengers of God. The Quran has a chapter called Maryam, which is an Arabic name for Mary. Mary has been given the highest honor in the women of all nations. We read Jesus' birth stories in a couple of chapters. We believe in what was revealed to him in Aramaic, the Bible in Arabic called the, the Injil. And we believe in Moses, peace be upon him, as one of the greatest messengers of God as well. He is mentioned in the Quran more than any other prophets. And his life story is narrated in several chapters. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad as the last messenger and the last revelation revealed to him, the Quran. Throughout our lives, we read their stories and reflect upon them. So these stories are Muslim stories as well. Prophet Muhammad did not bring a new message. He was commanded to follow in the footsteps of Abraham and call on to all people to acknowledge that there is one God, our creator, one message, and one humanity. Islam is not named after any human being or a particular tribe or a race. Islam's message is universal. Islam is about deeds. It's a verb. It's not a state of being. Rather, it's a process of becoming more, better, and striving to reach that state of perfect submission and connection with all. In one of the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, I find the clearest articulation of this. Once he was returning home from a battle and told his companions that we are returning home from a lesser jihad to a greater jihad, which is an inner struggle to be a good person and to be merciful to others. 
Unfortunately, the concept of jihad has been misunderstood by some so-called Muslims and by some non-Muslims as well. We, as the followers of all the prophets and Prophet Muhammad, who was sent to humanity as a mercy, need to be nothing but merciful to others. Compassion represents the true spirit of Islam. If I cannot soften my heart for the other, if I cannot embrace our common humanity, if I cannot acknowledge the otherness of the other, if I cannot respect the sanctity of every human life, then I need to reflect and ask myself, am I worthy of the designation a Muslim? Am I worthy of the designation a Muslim? The Quran says, there shall be no compulsion in religion. It calls on all humanity to strive together as in a race to do good. The essence of Islam is to avoid all extremes. We are supposed to be the religion of the middle path. Islam is not a hodgepodge of cultural and political ideologies and dividing theologies that Quran warns against. It's a simple tradition of peacefulness ethical behavior, submission to our creator, and service to his humanity. Prophet Muhammad brought a profound message of peace and social justice. Now let's look at who was Prophet Muhammad and what was his connection with Abraham and how the primary sacred sites of Islam tie into the biblical account. To understand Prophet Muhammad's family lineage and his mission, we need to go back to our patriarch Abraham, who plays a significant role in the development of Islam. This is where it all began, the Valley of Baqa. This is the ancient name for Mecca, Saudi Arabia. This valley is referenced in the Psalms 84, verses 4 to 6, and the Quran, chapter 3, verses 96 and 97. This house of worship is called the Kaaba. We believe that this sanctuary had been originally built by Abraham and his son Ishmael. The Kaaba is the center of the Islamic world for us. It has the historical primacy over all the other houses because of its connection with Abraham. And Prophet Muhammad was commanded to follow in his footsteps and revive the Abrahamic movement of monotheism. It is incumbent upon every Muslim once in their lifetime, if they have good health and financial resources, to make the pilgrimage to this sanctuary. Every year, more than three million Muslims from every corner, corner of the globe gather here to commemorate Abraham and his family's unwavering submission to God. It's like going, <clears throat> going back to our roots where it all began and to reaffirm our faith that there is no God but God, our creator. This is the place where baby Ishmael and mother Hagar were left when Sarah banished them. This was a barren land without any water. And this is the place when baby Ishmael starts crying with thirst and mother Hagar starts running, searching for water a spring emerges and this spring is, is uh, the same spring which Genesis makes a reference to by which Hagar stopped by known as Berla Heroi 
meaning well of the living one who sees me. Genesis 21, 19 to 22. This is the same well in Arabic we call the well of Zamzam, meaning the well of abundance. This well is still flowing even after 4,000 years and supplying water to all the pilgrims and the city of Mecca. Pilgrims bring back some bottles of Zamzam water and this is my bottle of Zamzam water. Uh, this is the place of orientation for our daily prayers, orienting space for Muslims throughout their lives, orientation even for their grave site. And this is the this orientation stands as a symbol of universal brotherhood. This is the place where Prophet Muhammad was born in the year 570 into the tribe of Ishmael. So through Ishmael, he becomes the direct descendant of Abraham. We are all cousins. I like to repeat this, we are all cousins through Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac. We all belong to the same family of Abraham. Unfortunately, sometimes Abraham's family seems dysfunctional. <laughs> right? We have a lot of work to do in that area. Uh, above all, we all come from the same source of reality. I call that reality in Arabic Allah. And my Jewish friends call that reality Elohim. Allah is not a different God as some people believe. The Quran refers to Jews and Christians as the people of the book. We feel a deep connection with you all and, and pray for all the descendants of Abraham in our daily prayers. Now let's look at why was there a need for Prophet Muhammad and what was his mission. By the time of Prophet's birth, people had moved away from monotheism and this sanctuary had become the center of idol worshiping. So 600 years after Jesus, peace be upon him, God chose Prophet Muhammad to revive the Abrahamic movement of monotheism, thus reasserting the primordial nature of monotheism. His ministry was for 23 years. Throughout his life, he had moral concerns about the society and wanted to change the condition of the people. He used to go up to a mountain cave and contemplate there for hours about nature, society, and the meaning of life. During one of these meditations, during the month of Ramadan, God sent angel Gabriel with the first revelations of the Quran. Prophet Muhammad did not know how to read or write, so he memorized those verses and dictated them to his companions. It took 23 years of revelations for the whole Quran to be completed. And all the verses were written down during the Prophet's time. Not a single word of the Quran has been changed from the time of its revelation. All the verses have been kept <coughs> intact. If you pick up a copy of the Quran in any part of the globe, in Arabic, you would not find any difference between that copy and my copy in Arabic. The Quranic message is as relevant to us today as it was 1400 years ago because its message is of peace, respecting the sanctity of every human life, justice and equality for all. The American values that we all cherish, service, charity, and tolerance, 
and the American ideals of, of liberty, freedom of religion, and, and justice for all are the same principles taught by the Quran to uphold. I do not find any contradiction between the Quranic teachings, the heart and soul of my faith, and the U.S. Constitution, the heart of our nation. I am proud to be an American and proud to be a Muslim. I don't find any conflict between these two identities. I would challenge those who see Islam and American values as incompatible. There is a long history of branding Islam as un-American and dehumanizing Muslims. Some call it a clash of civilizations, but actually it is a clash of ignorance. Back in the 7th century, the Quran introduced the concept that individuals have inalienable rights. And justice was at the core of its message. It was grounded in protecting the poor. This egalitarian spirit was shocking to the rich Arab. The Quran was asserting individual rights on the basis of equality of every human being. The Quran stood against all forms of racial discrimination. The Prophet appointed a freed slave as the first scholar to prayer and honored him as one of his distinguished companions. Contrast this with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s struggles. When our nation was going through segregation, all the mosques were integrated. The Quran gave rights to women at a time when women were considered property of men and women could own property. The Quran put an end to female infanticide. It posed the question, when the girl child who was buried alive is made to ask for what crime she had been slain. The Quran was countering tribal fights and calling for unity. The Quran was calling pagans to reason, reflect, and ponder over the creation of the universe and their own bodies and acknowledge that there is no God but God our Creator. But this call to reason did not go well with the pagans. And uh, the Prophet was faced with an enormous opposition and death threats. So God commanded him to move to the city of Medina where people were receptive to his message of monotheism. So this move was a, was a uh, turning point in the Islamic history. And the Islamic New Year <coughs> begins with this event of migration when Muslims achieved freedom of religion. When Muslims achieved freedom of religion. So here in Medina, the Prophet established the first Muslim community and the first Islamic state. He dictated a constitution in which Muslims, Jewish tribes, and the pagan Arabs, and all the other tribes entered into a social contract which became known as the Constitution of Medina, which granted equal rights to everyone, freedom of religion, peace, and justice for all. This is the first written constitution of human history and the first constitution of democracy in the history of the constitutional rule. And this happened in 622. And this constitution stands as a symbol of pluralism <coughs> in Islam. Because of these peaceful teachings, 
by the time of the completion of all the Quranic revelations and Prophet Muhammad's death, all the people of Arabia had moved away from idol worshipping and had come into the fold of Islam. And, this, and uh, when Prophet entered Mecca, the city of his birthplace, from where he was persecuted, he entered with humility and without any bloodshed and forgave all his enemies. When some Muslims were feeling overwhelmed with the victory and wanted to take revenge, he reminded them that greater jihad is ahead of us, which is an inner struggle to be merciful to others. And he cleansed this house from all the idols and rededicated it for the worship of one God, our Creator, and established Islam forever. The Quran says, if you kill one person, it is as if you have killed all of humanity. <coughs> and if you save one person, it is as if you have saved all of humanity. Islam allows fighting only in self-defense. There are strict rules of engagement. You cannot even destroy any crop. You cannot harm children and women. You cannot destroy any houses of worship. Furthermore, the Quran says, do not inflict more damage on your enemy than the enemy has inflicted upon you. But if you are patient, it will be better for you. Contrast this with ISIS's ideology. It's, it is totally un-Islamic. ISIS is antithetical to Islam. It's all about politics and power. ISIS has declared war on Prophet Muhammad's covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai in 628. This covenant commands all Muslims to protect Christians and their houses of worship. This covenant guarantees unconditional protection for all. If we disobey, then we would spoil God's covenant. Prophet Muhammad also said that human life is more sacred than the sacred house of Kaaba. I was in Paris last August. This is the Grand Mosque of Paris. This mosque has a profound history of Muslims saving Jews during Holocaust, which not many people know about it. This mosque was used as a secret refuge to hide Jews. And the Imam, the Muslim leader, gave fake Muslim birth certificates to protect them. This mosque was founded in 1926 after World War I by the French government as a token of gratitude to Muslims. More than 100,000 Muslims died fighting against Germany. A Muslim American <coughs> Marine wrote a testimony to his fallen Marine brothers when four Marines and one sailor were shot in Chattanooga, Tennessee by a Muslim with uh, <coughs> depression. He wrote in Associated Press, when I told my parents about my decision to enlist, they fully supported it because they knew Prophet Muhammad's commandment to all Muslims. Loyalty to your country of residence is part of your faith. Loyalty to your country of residence is part of your faith. 
Thus, by enlisting, I was fulfilling my obligations as a United States citizen and as a Muslim. He further wrote, I see nothing Islamic in this act of terrorism. No difference exists between the Chattanooga terrorists, the terrorist Dylan Drew, who allegedly killed nine innocent black Americans in Charleston, or James Holmes, the terrorist convicted of killing 12 innocent people in a Colorado theater, Adam Lanza killed 26 children in Sandy Hook Elementary School. The list goes on. <coughs> Let us not forget those who were killed just because they looked like Muslims. A white supremacist shot six worshipers at Wisconsin Sikh Temple just because they look like Muslims. Friends, terrorism has no religion. Terrorism has no religion. Emily Arrowwood of US News and World Report writes in her piece, the terrorism we tolerate. We would rather paint Islam as the face of terrorism most imminently threatening the US then talk about American-born non-Muslim radicals. According to the Justice Department's head of national security, anti-government extremists pose a greater threat than ISIS or Al-Qaeda. As you can see, the majority of the shootings are done by non-Muslims, but other religious communities do not face the responsibility of collective condemnation and backlash as our community faces. We always hear this refrain, where is the Muslim condemnation? Where is the Muslim condemnation? Of course we denounce these heinous acts. It grieves us to see loss of life. But somehow this all gets linked to Islam as if Islam is inherently a violent religion. In the battle against ISIS, only the radicals should be the enemy, not Islam and all Muslims. All religions have hateful radicals. Do you agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Let us not forget the Crusades the Inquisition, Holocaust, Bosnia Genocide. Again, the list goes on. <coughs> Unfortunately, our mainstream media and some politicians paint a distorted picture of Islam and Muslims. Repeated over and over again, these dangerous narratives can harbor hatred, which we are seeing now. Islamophobia is at its peak. And you can see us on our cable news, Islamophobia is, is rampant. Friends, we cannot let this anti-Muslim backlash expand. We have a moral imperative to defend our children and youth against these erroneous judgments. We need to work together. We need to share positive stories that highlight our common humanity. After Chattanooga shooting, Muslims and the local community work together. And the result of this working together, this beautiful plan for the five fallen service members, which testifies to how the city responded we did not riot, we prayed, we did not lash out at easy targets for revenge. Instead, we invited each other into our lives, homes, and places of worship. <coughs> Islam as a faith 
is meant for all places and times, a tradition that has sustained billions of followers for more than a thousand years and contributed enormously to human civilization. Today, there are Muslim communities on every continent, not on Antarctica, I assume. Today's Muslim world population is over 1.7 billion. According to the Pew Research, Islam is the fastest growing religion. And by 2050, Muslim population is going to reach around 3 billion. There are over 50 countries have Muslim majority populations although Islam is often associated with the Middle East, fewer than 15% of Muslims are Arab. And the entire region of Middle East and the North Africa is home to an estimated 315 million Muslims, whereas over 1 billion Muslims live in Southeast Asia. And there are over 8 million Muslims in the U.S. Muslims have been here since the birth of the nation. About a quarter to a third of the slaves brought here from Africa were Muslims. Most of them were forced to convert to Christianity. Some of them even fought in George Washington's army. You can find Muslim names on the rosters of his uh, soldiers. We all remember the Battle of Bunker Hill and Peter Buckminster, who fought in that battle, was perhaps Washington's most distinguished Muslim American soldier. He was born in Framingham, his master was Buckminster, and years after the battle, he changed his last name to Salam meaning peace. There were many more famous soldiers. Muslim soldiers have given lives protecting America. According to the Department of Defense, more than 3,500 Muslims fought in, in Afghanistan and Iraq war. And you can find uh, tombstones with Muslim names in the Arlington Cemetery. If those soldiers were alive today, they would challenge those who question Muslims' loyalty to our nation. Friends, our founding fathers included Islam and Muslims. They were ahead of us. Thomas Jefferson advocated for Muslims' rights. He speculated that there would be Muslims in the new nation. Ironically, Washington and Jefferson never knew that there were real Muslims already in America. There were Muslim slaves on Washington's plantation, though we don't have any records of Jefferson owning Muslim slaves. Jefferson had heard about European prejudices against Islam. But he looked beyond those prejudices and wanted to make sure that Muslims, Jews, Catholics, and all the other minorities have equal rights. Thomas Jefferson owned a copy of the Quran. He had ordered it while he was in the law school in 1765, 11 years before he wrote the Declaration of Independence. There's a long history of presence of copies of the Quran in, in American libraries going back to 1683. Massachusetts has its own history about the Quran. The first American edition was printed in Springfield in 1806, and the copies were sold in Worcester and Springfield. John Adams 
who helped to create the Massachusetts Constitution owned a copy of the Quran, which is kept in the Boston Public Library under rare manuscripts. I took this picture from Adam's copy. Friends, you will be very, very surprised to know that Prophet Muhammad's sculpture is inside the U.S. Supreme Court chamber. The statue carries Quran in one hand. The Quran is open and you can see Arabic on the pages. This is a great honor given to the Prophet as one of the greatest lawgivers of history. At this critical time, at this critical time when Islamophobia is at its peak, it is necessary to recognize this inclusion as a symbol of the positive relationship our founding fathers had with Islam. If you ask me, can American Muslims and American society move forward today? I would say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Unfortunately, it has been a very, very difficult road, making any gains toward inclusion. We can do it by following our founding fathers' examples. As George Washington said, to bigotry, no sanction. To bigotry, no sanction. And by affirming our common humanity, the Quran says, humanity is not but a single nation. God calls on to humanity, behold, we have created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another not that you may despise one another. I'd like us all to uh, reflect on this verse which has a profound meaning and inspires me deeply. Speaking to the whole of humanity, the Quran declares, your creation and your resurrection is but as a single soul. So this divide we have, us and them, the boundaries separating us from others are transparent in the light of the intrinsic nature of oneness of humanity, which is in itself a reflection of the oneness of God, which is the doctrine of our Islamic faith. There is no God but God, our Creator. The message is to serve humanity with compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. At the end, I'd like to talk briefly about this poster, which was created by the Anti-Islamophobia Committee of September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. This organization was founded by September 11th families who believe in turning their grief into action for peace. They have been working hard throughout these years countering Islamophobia. Robin Bernstein, who is uh, co-chair of the Anti-Islamophobia Committee, belongs to my interfaith book group. I am so honored to have this wonderful relationship with this organization. A Muslim mother is also a member of September 11th family because she lost her son. He was not in the towers at that time. He was commuting to work and saw the towers burning, so he rushed to help and died in the towers helping. Unfortunately, just because he was a Muslim, just because he was a Muslim, 
his name ended up on the terrorist list. Friends, we cannot even, I mean, imagine what his parents must have gone through. They tried hard to clear his name. <coughs> Finally, when his remains were found near the, near the North Tower, his name was cleared. Friends, we cannot let these dangerous stereotypes divide us. I strongly believe that there is so much goodness at the core of humanity. We need to seize this moment to show our compassion. <coughs> Moderate voices from all religion need to be heard. Together, together, we can move toward peace and unity. Peace be with you all. Thank you. So before we start uh, Q&A, I would like to share some positive uh, information about Muslims because you don't get to hear any positive things about us, right? <laughs> Uh, so there is a new survey came out which was done by um, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding uh, which shows that although Muslims in America are facing more violence than ever, they are actually among America's most model citizens. How about that? <laughs> and uh, when it comes to identifying as a patriot, 85% of Muslims have a strong American identity, just like 84% of Protestants. Additionally, the survey found zero correlation between Muslim, Muslim religious identity, mosque attendance, and attitudes toward violence. There's some more good news coming. Uh, more than half of Muslims report experiencing, compared to 5% of Jews, 4% of Catholics, and 2% of Protestants, but they are the most optimistic about the future of America. Finally, the survey says Muslims make Pretty great neighbors, too. <laughs> Pretty great neighbors. 38% of Muslims work with neighbors to solve problems, <laughs> almost equal to the percentage of Jews, 40%, and Catholics, 42%. Um, and, and the survey goes on. Um, and um, on the international <coughs> political level, I have some great news, I'm sure you all know about it, uh, that the Londoners have chosen a Muslim as their mayor. This is so exciting because London is like a second home to me. My sister lives there. She, she was visiting us and so she did the absentee ballet and, and she, uh, we're all excited. Um, so, this, this election wasn't without any controversy, obviously, and this uh, Muslim uh, mayor was painted as an extremist, but Londoners looked beyond that. They chose hope over fear. They chose unity over divisions. And, and they set a beautiful example for the whole world. That, that we should not, you know, like George Washington said, to bigotry, no sanction. And this happened when in Europe, as we know, the Islamophobia is at its peak and, and fierce debates going on over the, the refugee situation. But people understood the truth about Islam and Muslims. So um, I'll open it for any questions now, and uh, thank you for listening to me.
Yes. I understand what you're doing helps to bring understanding. Yes. And hopefully moving forward. What about those of us who sit here in the audience? What are the kinds of things you suggest we do to help? I would just sit here and listen to you. Uh, that's a very good question, and thank you for asking that. Um, so I think we need to uh, spread the message in our own circles that, you know, hey, you know, uh, this is not right, what you're saying and what the media is telling us. And so that would be helpful and, and get engaged and, uh, and uh, in your parishes and other places, encourage your clergy leaders to um, have a dialogue with, uh, you know, Muslims or, or, or do uh, some educational, uh, uh, you know, sessions like Southboro, you know, library is doing. So it's all about, uh, you know, be a part of the, the, the uh, educating community process. I think that would be a big, big help, a big help. Thank you for asking. Yes. When's Ramadan this year? Oh, starting on Monday. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi. I was curious about um, why um, some Muslims think it's you can't make a picture of the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good question because it's uh, uh, in our mosques we don't have any uh, you know, we, we are pure monotheistic religion and there are no statues or any figures uh, involved. Um, and in our mosques, you would not even see any pictures of people. The mosques are filled with uh, Quranic verses written in calligraphy and beautiful floral um, you know, paintings and those sort of things. So to, the Prophet wanted to make sure that people do not make him like idol, you know, like you're worshipping. So it's kind of just to be on the, uh, on the safe side and to just root it out from the, you know, what, uh, so th th that's why it's, uh, because it started out there were idol worshipping right before uh, at the time of his birth so that's why it's it's uh, not to um, have that kind of any connection it's kind of like some um like very reformed christianity where they you know they did the same thing they took all the statues out of it right exactly and and so there was a fear that if there are any pictures or anything some people might cling to it and start worshiping uh, the prophet like other communities have done. So this is why it's, uh, because Islam is purely, uh, it's a, you know, submitting to our creator. And, and we see our creator's uh, signs in the creation of the universe. And so these are all signs of, of uh, God. That's uh, like deist, deism. Yeah. And, and Jefferson and other founding fathers, they truly believed in, in deism. And I don't know how many of you know, Jefferson had taken a uh, razor blade and, and cut out all the, he made his own Bible. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it, it is interesting, he left the Quran intact on his bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Um, I, I used to be a teacher in one of my other lives, history teacher, and I often wonder how I would be, if I were teaching today, how I would possibly be dealing with subjects like this and um, the, all of the riots with racism and all of that. And I, I'm afraid that, <coughs> I've heard that, te well, I've seen a survey that teachers tend to stay away from things that are difficult because they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing, and whatever they do, one you know, one group is going to be unhappy, and the other way. And that. So, have you seen or heard or know of any um, schools that have done particular courses or done something that would 
really help students to understand? If they don't understand, then I am not sure about fine. what courses in what town they are following, but I know that some schools, uh, a couple of schools, have re reached out to us to send uh, a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, I think teachers should um, first try to get the right material from you know reliable sources. Mm -hmm. And, and, and should not be afraid to say, hey, this is, you know, all reliable information. Because I give you an example. I, after 9-11, uh, this uh, school in Needham, Catholic school, uh, Haddad Mons, uh, there's this Haddad on Needham Mons, uh, Monsignor School. It's a private school. They um, invited me to speak to their uh, students, uh, but the, uh, there was some backlash and the priest who invited me, the, their teacher, parents wrote to him that how dare you invited a Muslim woman to talk to our kids. So he wrote two pages explanation why he felt this was a moral obligation for him to teach our students the, the, the right message. Because he said he grew up, he grew up with a suspicion about Islam all his life. But when he was in college, when he was in the seminary, he was taking philosophy courses in, in, um, in California, and there was a, uh, um, the student association wanted to show this movie, uh, the um, last, uh, what was the movie very controversial about last Jesus? Temptation. The Last Temptation of, of Christ. And um, so the student union wanted to show and some people protested but they wanted to go ahead with it. But out of all the student uh, union members, there was one person who said no. And that was a Muslim. And he said, what is insensitive for Christian brothers and sisters is insensitive to me. I, and I would not want this to be shown. This movie just respects Jesus, peace be upon him. So this priest, he was like, wow. Until that encounter, he had the suspicion about Islam and Muslims. And this encounter totally changed him. And he did not want his students to, to, to grow up with the same kind of suspicion like he had. So he felt he wrote two pages and he sent a copy to me. So I think the educators, and, 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 and leaders, they need to stand up. They need to do what is right. I mean, you might not be the most popular person, but you know in your heart that you have done the right thing. That's what I believe in strongly, and that's what I always do. It doesn't matter whether I'm making friends or, or, or you know, or enemies, but I stand for what is the truth. I think that's that's what uh, you know. And there is a for teachers also. There is a good web website. It is called Teaching Tolerance, mm -hmm. and this is part of the the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful uh, you know resource, and you can go to that, and you can contact. Uh, educators can contact uh, the, the nearby Islamic Center or some organizations and they would send you tons of material and and you know th then tell the history department that hey you know we want to you know educate our youth because Muslims are not going away anywhere we are here we are here I was uh, reading this just uh, last week that there were two uh, young women sitting in an ice cream uh, store in California and eating ice cream with their friend and this man 
reading about this whole Muslims. And so the shopkeeper said, we are not going to serve you. And he was quoted out and he was so mad that he said, I do not want them in my country, pointing to those girls. Well, they, they were first scared, but when they saw the shop, you know, the person behind the, the, the cash register is supporting <coughs> this, so they got a little brave and they took a video while he was doing, <coughs> going out and then coming in and saying all kinds of things. And, and, you know, you need to go back to your country. They are born and brought up here. Where, where do they need to go? And that's not his, just country. So they are, the shopkeeper stood up, right? So we need these kind of uh, gestures, compassion. Unless we do this more and more and we see this and share the stories so we can change the narrative. So, so it's important, you know, like it's, and, and it's also, uh, we have like disrespect for uh, sacred texts. We have Mr. Terry Jones or Reverend Terry Jones burning copies of the Quran and the copies of the Quran are, are being flushed down the toilet in Guantanamo Bay. All kinds of things are happening and I just read uh, yesterday that there's a man in California is, uh, has come up with this the American Quran and about the Nova's uh, flood, he's doing Katrina and, and all kinds of things. Why? And people ask me, you people have no uh, tolerance. Well, I said, you know, people are seeing what other, I mean, do, I mean, it's name calling, right? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's very difficult. Thank you, that was a very good question, how we can make a difference. And that's, you know, I mean, all religions teach that treat others the way you like to be treated. It's a simple golden rule. Yes. Just a comment uh, that uh, Muslim families uh, here in Southborough have invited our community uh, to break the Ramadan fast and iftar celebration on Friday, uh, the, the 17th of June. Oh, at 7.30, it's at St. Mark's Parish Hall at the church they wanted to do at the community center, but the venue wasn't big enough, so that it's going to be over at St. Mark's Parish Hall uh, at the church. Oh, and wonderful. Friday uh, at 7.30, and we'll have information out for others. But oh, so, uh, so this coming Friday? Friday the 17th. Oh, 17th, okay. So. Yeah, we uh, have at our mosque in Wayland a uh, number of interfaith uh, bridge building uh, fast breaking dinners uh, are going on um, so mm -hmm. it's it, Ramadan is a very busy m month mm -hmm. and also this community gathering so we are extending it to to you know bring in our uh, neighbors and and uh, other from other uh, interfaith uh, communities so it's that that should be great yeah. I would love to hear more about it it's the, the, the Muslim families oh, in town are, are oh, in South Ferrari. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Maybe you should go out in the, uh, you know, my South Borough. No, yeah, absolutely will. Or something. <laughs> absolutely will. And, and if you try to get media, they would never cover you. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> something positive, they don't want. We try so hard. People, you know, ask us, I mean, where are the moderate Muslims? We are right here under your nose, but nobody wants to hear us. Nobody wants to hear us. And this um, September 11th families, they were doing a, uh, uh, you know, anti, uh, I mean, Islamophobia campaign past uh, Ramadan. And they sent out invitations to all the officials, councilmen, and, and, and everyone, and all the media, outlets, not a single person showed. Mm -hmm. And we were at the, uh, they were kicking off a, um, uh, you know, party at the, uh, I mean, kind of gathering at the state house. So we were all there hoping 
that Fox News is right there, right? At least they would show up. I mean, I'm not a Fox fan, but still, I'll take it for the. <laughs> I'm sorry if anyone is. Uh, <laughs> but I'll be happy to be on Fox or CNN or anywhere because, you know, we are, we really want our uh, moderate voices to be heard. Uh, but so it's, uh, you know, it's uh, what sells the paper or, or the news. So please don't um, blanket the condemnation of the media like we do with everything else. I'm, I'm a person who writes a column for the local paper. I've been a newspaper reporter. I do lots of things. And no, no, I meant uh, mainstream media. Well, not mainstream. <laughs> yeah, mainstream media, but the, the, the local, I don't mean yeah, to, no. yes. I mean, I'm sure you are doing uh, uh, what you can, and in, in, uh, so it's, it's about the mainstream media. That's what I meant. No, please don't. <laughs> no offense. I love uh, town uh, papers and the reporters, and uh, we need them. We need them. So I'm talking about the uh, uh, you know, other uh, mainstream media. I'll send you what I write about this. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, wow. Uh, I look forward to reading that. Thank you. Um, I, I, found, I found very interesting about your talk that, um, you know, it, they try to make it into such a political issue. Yes. Um, I can, there are things about, you know, what you were saying about Islam that I think would appeal to very conservative religious yeah. people, and there are things that would appeal to people on, you know, I'm on, kind of on the liberal end of the spectrum. And I mean, it's, and I'm sure you have, like, I mean, there's nothing about, it's like, you know, it's it's like saying Christianity is conservative or liberal. It, it isn't. You can you know, right. Pol politics can be yes. The know, the, the spectrum, yes. Right? So th this is the problem: conflation of religion and politics. When that happens, mm -hmm. then then you know you lose it. Yeah. And so so for Islam, the conflation of religion and politics, I mean, overshadows the whole. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, compassionate message of the Quran and, and you hear in some of the places, oh no, the Quran is teaching extremism. I said, you know, you do an intellectual autopsy of the Quran and see what you find. Go <laughs> word by word. Uh, people take verses out of context and that is so dangerous. And then and, and they say, uh, they have not read it but they heard somewhere or, or God knows what. But, but they, they, they would say it with such authority that this is what is happening in Islam. And, and then we get lectured. Oh, you need to reform, you need to do this. But first, you know, if, if we don't understand all the dynamics of it, then it's, it's, it's difficult. That was a good... Um, Good comment. So I <coughs> want to be respectful of the time and thank you so much for coming and uh, I'm grateful to the trustees of the Southboro Library for providing us this wonderful opportunity to come together and learn about each other and uh, so uh, thank you and I hope to see you again. Thank you.